Hello and welcome to the webinar. So today's topic is all about logos. One of my favorite subjects when it comes to branding is the logo. Um, logos, now the question is, do you really need one? I and mean, if you're branding yourself, if you're focused on building your own business and branding you, do you really need a logo? And then if you wanted a logo or felt you needed a logo, well, how would you go about getting one or creating one? So if you're wanting to build a strong business with a very strong brand and a very strong presence, then you're definitely in the right place. If you want to leverage the laws of attraction to actually pull customers into you, uh, then you're definitely in the right place. Because we're going to be talking about some things that actually can help you on both of these fronts. And by the time we're finished with this web session, you're going to be able to answer that burning question for yourself. Logo or no logo? You're also going to have a really good idea of some of the things to consider um, in creating a, a, a logo and some pointers on where you might go if you want some assistance in creating a logo. And we'll take a look at some of the um, biggest icons and learn some lessons from them, some, some of the messages that they have to teach us beyond just what their brand is. So my name is Janice Summers, and I am actually going to be your guide for today. And just like you, I started my own company. I've actually started a couple of companies, and I've been on a uh, part of a founding board of a nonprofit organization. So I've had to answer these questions more than once. I mean, do I need a logo? And the answer is it all depends. And should I get one if I don't have one again? That depends. It depends on a personal choice. I've heard arguments go both ways. I've heard arguments that say you should have a logo, and I've heard arguments that say a logo is not important. But I say only you can answer that for yourself. Now, you need to be able to answer it armed with the right information so that you can make the right choice for you. I will tell you that personally, I have always had a logo. I've always had a strong brand identity even before I launched the company. Um, any and all of the companies that I've been involved with have had a brand. For me, it's just an undeniable part of my branding strategy. It's, it's an important integral piece to my whole overall story. And if I launch with everything else, then it has a relational tie so that eventually it can grow its own legs and stand on its own and have its own recognition. Um, and we'll go into more details about what a brand logo can do for you. I, I don't like to tell people what they should or shouldn't do. After all, you're building your own business. And I believe if you're building your business, then you need to make these decisions. My job is to inform, educate, nurture, and help guide you help to provide the right information for you so that you can make those choices. But it's your company after all, and I believe firmly that you should make the choice for yourself. But if you're looking to grow big um, and you're looking to have a nice, long, sustainable company, then, you know, having a logo might give you an advantage. Having a logo not having a logo, sorry, not having a logo won't hurt you either. So let me be clear on that. You don't have to have a logo. It's not going to hurt you. But having one could give you some strategic advantage, which any advantage you can get in business is good. And if you're like me, you have big plans and even bigger dreams. So if you're wanting to create a business that's in harmony with you, one that can grow exponentially, one that has a solid foundation, right? because you want to build on a solid foundation, 
one where you want to have customers lining up to get your products or service. You don't have to chase them. They're actually chasing you. And you want to have those nice, long, established relationships. Then what wouldn't you do for that kind of business? I mean, that would be the dream business for anybody to have all of those aspects. That's the ultimate goal for all of us. Now, a logo is not going to create that for you, but a logo could help identify you. It's just another piece in the puzzle, in the big cosmic puzzle. So here's kind of a fun thing. You know, why do logos even matter? Now, first off, how many brands can you name on, on this image? And be honest with yourself. When you're, when you're recognizing do you have a little ping of an emotion or a memory or a feeling or a thought that's beyond just the brand? Do you understand that company without any of their messaging, without any taglines, without even the name of the company? Do you understand what they're about or what their signature thing is? So branding actually really is way more than a logo. But the logo could become so powerful that the simple sight of the image can evoke those strong physical and emotional bonds. And that's called brand affinity. And a brand affinity, that positive relationship, that warm feeling that you can evoke is something that you want to strive for. It's something that every single company wants to strive for. That's why they get very protective of their brand and their brand identity. Is because they want to reach that affinity. And that's the part where your customers will line up to greet you. They will beat the doors down. They'll sleep outside of your store uh, for days in order to get your latest product, even though they just got the new product a few months ago. They're willing to re-up again for the latest one. So these brands, these iconic icons, have actually achieved some, some pretty high status. One of them, it's really interesting, one of them has actually achieved such a status, it grew beyond the parent company to the point where the board farmed out or sold off the parent company and kept the child and reintroduced themselves as that child company. And, and that is absolutely fascinating because the product itself, when it first launched, because it had a name that wasn't all that enticing, uh, it kind of failed. They had to pull it back in and they called it something else. And they had a logo that went with it that had a big identity when it first launched on the second go around. And that's the story of Monster, Monster Beverage. So that's that crazy M. So that's really a lot of power in a logo. So what, what are logos designed to do? Let's talk about the designing of a logo. Now, talk about attraction, right? I just gave the example of Monster and how actually Hanson Soda was the one, was the company who originally uh, launched that beverage. And they're a California company. And they originally launched it. it. It failed. I think they called it like super energy drink or something like that or natural energy drink. And it failed. So then they relaunched it as Monster. And then it just grew to the point where the Hansons eventually sold. So the holders of Hanson sold it to Coca-Cola now. Um, and Monster is on its own with three sub brands underneath it. So, but talk about attraction. I mean, that's the ultimate in attraction that you just see that that, that monster mark and, and you're pulled to it. The Nike Swoop, one of my favorite iconic icons, the Nike Swoop. Um, these are high status. But now, before you think that they hit the ground with that, now monster is kind of an exception. Uh, it, it really takes a lot of work. It, not all of them hit that status out of the gate. And in fact, you might not have even really noticed General Mills, but it's on all your cereal. It's been around so long. 
but it takes work and commitment and it's a piece of your branding message but if it's congruent with everything else that you're doing and it's partnered with all of your other messaging it actually can get that recognition eventually and the payoff of recognition of a logo can be quite significant and sometimes the logo is subtle it doesn't have to be in your face and bold but it does need to get some attention Sometimes that attention is a calming attention. But it, the bolder the logo, the better. So let's take a look. Let's do a, let's have a little experiment and take a look at a couple of, of logos that are pretty bold. Okay, here's my first one. <laughs> the Nike Swoop. Yes, I think I've said it before. This is probably my favorite um, in Iconic Icons. I love the story of this. They didn't want a logo, actually, at first. They hired it out, so they had someone draw something. They had, and I think they paid the artist like $35 for it. They didn't really like it, but they figured it would grow on them. It has gotten so iconic that the company doesn't ever need to mention their name. Everyone knows the Nike Swoop. And they've actually split their name away from the logo. Originally, they had the name partnered with the logo all the time so that it became a, a joined piece. But now they've actually separated it. So everybody knows the Nike Swoop. And the interesting part about this design, which I thought was brilliant on the artist's point of view, is if you've ever run, which I was a marathon runner, and to me it really does signify when you, the toe touches and then the foot pulls back on, on the follow-through of the step. It kind of makes that check motion. And, of course, Nike started out as running shoes. So let's take a look at another one. Here's General Mills. It's on your cereal boxes, chances are. You, you may have missed it, but this logo has never changed since its inception, and it's been around for decades. Here's another trusted brand. Um, now, for some people, it might evoke uh, the memory of a little bug, a little loud, noisy bug. For me, I always think of camping because I have a Eurovan, which is the camping conversion uh, a Volkswagen, but there's another highly recognizable logo, very bold, very sharp edges. Here's another one in the fitness industry. So if you've been working out and you've been wearing these Under Armour clothes, that's their logo. I always think of a weightlifter for some reason when I look at this, like their legs are firmly planted and their arms are reaching up. So they did a pretty interesting job with their use of negative and positive space and the actual uh, letters of their brand name. Here's another one where they used a letter to brand. They've dropped the three other letters, but it's still everywhere you want to be. They've incorporated uh, the colors all in the one V. And I think their choice of colors is pretty interesting. And if you've done my, my color uh, training session, then you'll know the value of blue and the value of that orange. Orange is a little risk-taking and blue is trust. So we can understand why they pick those colors for Visa. So there's some examples of some logos that are pretty bold. The other thing a logo can do is it can really pull you in, either by its use of colors and shape to pull the eye in, or it's eye-catching in that it's telling a story. So there's a couple of different ways um, that they pull you in. So let's take a look at a couple of... Uh, a couple of logos that are designed to pull you in and how they designed it to pull you in and get your attention. So two big, bold circles of bright color that's bound to get anybody's attention. Yellow is um, a very bright, upbeat, but it's this is a little orange and one is a little red. So red is the first color you see on the color spectrum and it gets your attention. And orange, orange is like gold in the color of me. And it's, um, it's another attention getter, but a risk taker. 
So MasterCard chose wisely in the colors that it picked. It's also a color colors of excitement. And the two circles together look binoculars that almost scream to you, look at me. Um, and let's take a look at another one. The Golden Arches, uh, another good example of something that pulls you in. Um, safety, umbrella, the color is playful, cheery, family friendly. So it also gets your attention, big and bold. Now talk about bold logos that get your attention. Uh, there's nothing like a big old bullseye to pull your eye right into the center. You can't help but look in the center of a bullseye. That's why it makes a great target. <laughs> so hence the name of the store. They could have they could have done anything and it's going to get attention. So here's another fun one. Um, so this company actually was founded in 1833 and they started using this logo first in 1904. So it's been around quite some time and this is a uh, another fun fact is a $451 billion company, and this is their logo, and they've used it for many, 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 many years. But the colors, again, are bright. They get your attention. They're easy to see at night as well, so you know you have a trusted uh, petrol station that you can pull into. The, the nice uh, yellow that pulls you into the center and the arrows that point down that kind of point to a center focal point draws the eye in so it's a really interesting use of of the shell so what about some other uh, bold or in in, in uh, engrossing logos here's one that has an interesting story and this one actually tells a story or conveys a story as well as a bold statement um, so, and it does get your attention, but this one gets your attention because you want to know what's coming next. You want to know the story behind it, but it does get your attention. Also, the use of black and white. Black is used a lot in prestige brands. This is Coach. This logo actually was designed for them in 1962. They started using it. But you can see what they're conveying. Right, it's a symbol of luxury and elegance. You, know, you have status and dignity when you carry a coach bag. So Prudential, you might not have recognized this, maybe you had. This company has been around, oh gee, just since 1876, so more than a couple years. And they first used this, this is the Rock of Gibraltar. Um, and it was pretty significant as far as steady, steadfast, sturdy, un, unyielding. So if you're in a financial institution, that's probably a pretty good symbol, a piece of the earth, a piece of the rock. Uh, their phrase with this they partnered was Prudential has the strength of Gibraltar. So something that's very strong and bold signifies confidence and also, of course, the color blue. But that's for another training. <laughs> Here's another, I love this logo. Um, this is actually for the Philadelphia Zoo. And I love the fact that they use, I mean, it's bold because it's black and white, but they use negative and positive spaces, I think, very creatively to get attention. And you know what to expect. You know what you're going to see. All right. So another thing um, that logos are designed to do is they're designed to carry, carry a message, carry the message of the brand. So not just part of the story, the brands have a full story and anything you can do to carry that story forward or to reassert that story in everything, in your logo, in your content. We've gone over some of these other aspects and, and previous trainings, but your logo, you wanted to say the same thing or to help convey that message, your overall company message. So let's take a look at a couple of, uh, a couple of logos here and, and what they've done. 
So this one is a pretty bold statement. Um, again, the color orange, risk taking. It's partnered actually, usually with three letters that are in blue. So they've balanced the risk and the security. But this is very bold. This is kingly. This is confidence. This is a financial company. So those are good messages to convey. Now, the origin of this goes back to the Dutch roots of the founders of the company. And the orange is the, natural, the national color for um, the Netherlands. So still a good job on the logo and how it conveys a message for their brand and for their company. This one also has the other significance of having a deeper rooted meaning for the founders of the company. So this one is for all of your crowning achievements. Um, and that is actually the tagline that went with this Rolex logo. You know that whatever's coming with this logo, with the crown, that this is a kingly treasure. So they're conveying that elegance, that richness. It's golden color. Again, royalty, regal. It's no wonder that Rolex watches are the prized um, gift for retirements or for achievement, for great achievement. That's uh, how Rolex got its reputation. So another storytelling logo, I think this one is a pretty bold um, storytelling logo. And Thomas Burberry was uh, born in 1835, somewhere around there. This is uh, from England. So he did something quite ingenious. He was in, in the fabric industry and he invented gabardine. And gabardine is that fabric that is naturally water, uh, weatherproof. So it repels water without having to be uh, too heavy or coated. And it revolutionized rainwear. And it is forever changed uh, rainwear. And they also patented the trench coat design uh, in 1912. But the, the image of the logo is very... Um, significant. The Latin that is on the flag stands for forward. Uh, this logo actually was created in 1901. Uh, it's been in use ever since and it is patented for them, trademarked for them. Um, the equestrian carrying a shield, it stands for the purity, nobleness, and honor. And the shield, of course, is protection. When you think of the raincoat itself is protection. Now, they do more than raincoats now. They do fashion and perfumes. And they have a variety of things that the brand does. But um, it stayed true to its founding. And, of course, the black color in most prestige brands, you will find that they use the color black to... Um, represents strength uh, and highly desirable. So what is another aspect of a logo? If you're gonna if you're gonna design a logo, you want to design something that's going to stay with the receiver, something that's easy for them to digest and, and stay keep a hold of, something that they can grab grab onto. So either in the simplicity or just the fact that it's been around in the repetition of it so that it's been seen so many times that it evokes um, a, me um, a meaning beyond um, or that it's, it's a, such a congruent story with all of your other content collateral when you're talking about your brand. So let's take a look at a couple of logos and see what I mean. So here's one, simple, 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 a box with an F in it, reverse color. You can reverse this color, change this color. The F is always the same. You'll always know this is the Facebook or Facebook button. So you'll recognize this very easily. It's not hard. And again, the color blue. Back to the Nike swoop. You knew I was going to bring up the Nike swoop again, right? <laughs> So simple, 
consistent. I think the only thing they may have changed in this is maybe the angle of the swoop has changed a little bit. Maybe the tail has gotten more elongated, but it's pretty much stayed uh, close to the original. Here's another one, another iconic icon that um, hopefully they will never change. I mean, they change the color, but they don't change the shape or design. Now, originally, um, one of the founders drew the original design, and it was very complicated. It was a tree, apple tree, Einstein, or um, Newton, so the law of gravity. Well, they wanted to encapsulate that whole thing and the redesign of it, and I think this was done in 79. I'm not sure. Um, but they drew an apple, and then they had to take a bite out of it because it looked like a cherry. So the bite out of the apple, that's how that bite mark got in there. But it hasn't changed. I mean, it started out with Technicolor uh, or all these little rainbow colors because when it first came out, when Apple first came out, it was really geared towards the artist because it had some exceptional, exceptional processing for arts. Um, and it still does very well with artists, but that's uh, why it had the color. And then, then eventually they dropped it. And But they keep the apple the same. They just change the color of it. Here's another one. Now, this one is a simplification of its original um, icon. So its original icon is the name of the company and a strategic placement of that arrow. But a simplified version of it is just the A with the little smiley arrow underneath. So it's interesting how they took pieces of the original um, iconic logo and have made it even easier. Uh, who doesn't love Amazon and their little happy face, happy shoppers? So GE, General Electric, has not changed their logo in all the years that they've had it. The color may have changed, but it's always been a shade of blue and white. Um, and it is a trusted logo. So it's one you would look for in your uh electronics or in your light bulbs, you look for General Electric. Very recognized worldwide. Now, logos aren't always images. So you're not locked into just having an image. We've seen some logos that are letters. You know, we've seen some logos that are images and we've seen logos that are a combination of a letter with an image. But logos can also be names. They use negative and positive space. Some names they get really creative with um, so that they get a reputation all on their own just for the fun and playfulness. So let's take a look at a couple of these uh, logos and see what I'm talking about. So Coca-Cola, very graceful, very, um, very graphic. They're Font choice, and it's always been red. Hasn't changed. So this is their their logo. Ha, has remained virtually the same in all of the years that the company has been around, in the decades that they've been around, and it's on everything that they do. Now, sometimes it's red with a white background. Sometimes it's white with a red background. But you're going to see that combination, red and white, or just the red on, on white. So consistency throughout all the years. Here's a fun one. So this is a logo that, again, is the company name. And the way that the font is is actually uh, it, it's dramatized so that it gives a certain effect. It kind of gives that cartoon swoopy effect. So that mirrors what the company is about. Fun family friendly, adventurous, playful, a little cartoony. So this one, Campbell's has been around for a millennia, it seems like. They have not changed their logo. And after Andy Warhol did the painting, why would you ever want to change it? Because it really became an icon with Andy Warhol's painting. So Campbell's Soup is another good example of a brand that used a name. FedEx, again, 
Federal Express shortened their name, created FedEx, and this is how they, uh, this is their logo. They sandwiched the D up against the E, um, dropped off the press part, and just kept X. They also used negative space, and if you look right here, you can see where there's an arrow signifying forward momentum and speed and efficiency in delivery. Kleenex brand, again, Kleenex, Kleenex <laughs> is, is so, built such a, a great brand name that you see the name, you speak the name, and you think of face tissue. They didn't invent face tissue. There's other creators of face tissue, but everybody calls it Kleenex. So they've done a really good job of putting their brand out there so that it becomes, you go for a Kleenex, not a face tissue. Xerox is another company um, that had done that with copies because they had become, they cornered that market and they did a really good job on branding that everybody knew, knew it as a Xerox and not a, a copy. So here's that A again, Amazon. So the company logo was the name. And the arrow connected the A to the Z because you can find everything from A to Z on Amazon. And they are big on customer satisfaction. So, and I can tell you from a, from a company perspective as well as from a buyer perspective because I take on both roles with Amazon and an affiliate role with them. I, my companies are on Amazon. Um, and they've really got it dialed in pretty good if you ask me. So their logo, everything from A to Z with happy customers and focused on customer satisfaction. That says a lot in their little logo. And now with the A, with the, with the smiley arrow, they're simplifying their logo even more. Johnson & Johnson, I always think of Band-Aids and First Aid. You can't help but think of First Aid. That's how the company started. Their logo has been around since the 1900, I think 19... They've been around since the 1800s, um, but the logo, the logo might go back to the late 1800s when they first launched. I think the logo goes back to like 1887 or 88, something like that. And it's the signature and they haven't changed it. It's red signature um, and it hasn't changed in all those years. So I, I think this makes it probably one of the oldest if not the oldest logo. Again, highly recognized. Here is a fun one. Now, when they launched, I mean, who, who doesn't know Google Doodles? Who doesn't look forward to Google Doodles? They do some really interesting, crazy things with their, with their name. But it's always the, the bright, festive colors is their branded logo. Um, you can doodle the Google as much as you want, but this is their logo. And I think the doodles themselves also speak to the fun creativity um, of the company brand. And that's what they're trying to achieve. And that's the message that they're trying to convey. Ease of use. They're very childlike colors. Very fun. Um, fun and easy. So let's kind of go over those design considerations again. When you're thinking of building your own logo, you want to think about getting attention and pulling in whoever the receiver, you know, your viewers are. You'd like it to tell a story, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be that complicated as long as your logo doesn't go against your overall brand message. It's ideal if you can make a lingering impression that's going to last with them so that it gets high, highly recognizable. But remember, it's, you know, it can be not just an image. It's the whole message that you tie with everything that eventually that image becomes a substantial notice, a recognition. You can be creative and think of negative and positive spaces. You also want to be cautious of negative and positive spaces and angles. But we'll, I'll show you some examples at the very end of some rather embarrassing failures. Um, 
but it can be simple, right? It doesn't have to be complicated. You know, I, I will tell you, I one of my companies, I have a much more complicated logo, but it's everywhere and it's on everything. And I intentionally launched my companies with the, with a strong eye to branding. And I was at an event hundreds and hundreds of miles away from home and I had a banner of my company and I can't tell you how delighted I was. And this was when I had first started out. Um, but I can't tell you how delighted I was when somebody looked at my logo and said, I know this brand. I know that logo. I recognize that logo. I was pleased as punch because it did a good job. It left an impression and it was a lingering impression and it was one that they felt positive about. And that's the best you can hope for with your logo. And then you work like the Dickens to to help support that image going forward. So does your design change? Sure. Designs may change over time. They don't always stay the same. Sometimes they they do, like the Johnson and Johnson hasn't changed since the 1880s. And sometimes they they you want to go through revamping, or sometimes companies think, well, we need to modernize. So let's take a look at one. NBC, the, the, that was their call letters, National Broadcasting Company. And when they first started out on radio, this was their logo. And it was the radio waves and the microphone. Um, so it definitely stood for, for what they were about. And the company was founded in 1926. So not real old when we're talking about some of the companies we've been looking at. Um, this first logo was was introduced in 1926 when they were on the radio, but they've changed uh, the 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 company logo since then. So their next iteration was actually um, the xylophone with the with the hammer, and audibly the xylophone, those three sounds, it was the NBC. It actually, that's what that mirrored, was the sound of their call letters being played on the xylophone. Then came color television. And NBC was proud as a peacock to display all the colors you could see on the color television and how they did such a good job with color. So they launched this proud peacock. And that held for a little while, but then um, somebody decided that it was time to make another change to their logo. And they came up with a new design. So this peacock was around 1950s, I think, was when the peacock was introduced. Yeah. Uh, then they came up with this, this brown snake. I don't know why, but they did. And they stuck with this, actually, for 16 years. And then they realized, well, you know what? They want to change the logo again. And after much anticipation and a lot of excitement, they launched their new logo. <laughs> and this was their new logo. This logo... So this is where we have a cautionary tale. Now it's one thing to go change in your logo, that's okay. As you know, trends change and things change. They're not afraid to change their logo. But here's a cautionary tale of money. They spent, uh, what was it, 750,000 to $1 million. So this is a million dollar design. I, I don't know about you. But I can see why they caught a lot of flack. And actually, there's a Saturday Night Live skit about this logo. And I think Gilda Radner is wearing the N. So look that up for, you know, Saturday Night Live. This was introduced in 1976. So uh, it only lasted four years because somehow somebody didn't do their research, I guess, and didn't realize that there was a nonprofit uh public broadcast television station that was using something almost exactly like this. So they got sued for an additional $800,000 worth in equipment and uh, somewhere around 65000 in in uh, damages for, for the other company to have to develop a new logo.
but NBC got to keep the end shape. <laughs> And so in 1979, they introduced a whole new logo. There you go. Now, this is what's been reintroduced. Of course, this is a more recent change, it's, but it's, this is virtually the logo that they've had since 1976. And you can see how they you know, brought back the peacock, but it's used in a negative space. And they've simplified the number of feathers, and they've just stuck with the primary colors, so that's pretty cool. But it's very bright, vibrant, very recognizable logo. So you can change designs, it's okay, it, it has happened, but you wanna be careful on changing your design. Um, you wanna make sure that you're changing it for the right reasons. And you also wanna be careful that you're not infringing on someone else's logo because companies are very protective of their logo design. I know a lot of people who are branding themselves just rely on their, their letters, of their initials of their name. That's what I did when I launched the service part of my business. I, I relied on my initials. You know, I, I chose the colors and I chose the shape and I chose the opening at the bottom of the J and the opening at the S and the shape of the oval instead of a circle for many reasons but I just kind of kept things simple myself because it worked for me. So other people will use things like their personal signature. I mean, it's easy to claim your personal signature. That's yours. So this is an artist, right? An individual. Here's a band. I think this is because of Mick Jagger. <laughs> so, um, Right, so there's a band logo, and here's another artist you might have heard of who drew this logo himself. This is his logo, and he drew it. So here's an example of some other individuals. Now, some have used uh, an initial or all of their initials in creative ways, or they've used a shape. Um, so there's several different ways that you can go about creating creating an iconic look for yourself and your logo. And it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It should be congruent with your message. I, I particularly like this one and their use of negative and positive space to have both the Jackie and Jordan represented because there's a J nested inside the J. Pretty clever. So again, you know, you want to think of things, uh, consider some, some aspects when you're designing things. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I can't design a logo. I'm not talented. I'm not artistic. It turns out that there are people out there that you can hire to do it for you. Uh, they're more than happy to. A word to the wise, I would give them as much guidance as possible. Um, because ultimately the design of your logo really does land on you and an artist is only can only do as much as they're guided to do but there's a lot of places you can go for um, for artists you might know an artist that you can pay to have them do an original artwork for you it's always nice to have an original artwork um, because it's original and you're not stealing it from somebody else or borrowing it from someone else. You want these things to kind of be original. They can also play with font. Now, I want to tell you, be careful. So here's, here's our cautionary tale. Be careful when you're creating logos and especially logos if they have children in it because placement is important. So I don't know if the Catholic diocese thought of that when they had this logo created. There have been some epic failures. So when you create a logo, you want to make sure you have more than one person look at your logo before you go live with it, because it could be quite embarrassing. And again, when you're trying to depict children in your logo with adults, it can get kind of tricky. So be very careful. And make sure that, you know, you don't have to depict every aspect of equipment. Sometimes it's good to take things off. And this one's really kind of unfortunate. Obviously, we can tell it's mama's baking and something is on fire. 
Now, if you've ever had a wood burning stove or a wood adobe stove, you know that that's supposed to be the shape of a stove, but that's not what it displays as. And again, the negative and positive space, you have to look at it from a couple of different aspects because coloring can bring out an emphasis um, that is probably not anticipated and not the one you wanted to convey for this lovely tea house. So it's got the, you know, the, the drastic swoop, but it kind of looks a little off-putting. So that's all I've got for you. I, I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope you found some value here. If you found some value, please feel free to share it with others. And I truly do believe that with the right kind of support and the right kind of training, there is no limit to what you can achieve. And I am happy to help you. Um, here are some resources that I have built that uh, may help you on your journey. I talked about that color, adding color impact. So if you want to check that out, it's a self-paced workshop, which gives you some details on what the colors are, the color meanings, so that you can play with things when you're working on your brand. And there's the link for you. Um, and again, I always like to make sure that when you're creating a rock solid foundation, that you know who you are, what you're about, because it's really important in your branding message that you know these things, that you know your purpose and you know what you want people to perceive you as so that in every aspect of your branding, from your website to your tweets, to the quotes that you choose to use, to the logo design that you choose to use or having no logo at all, that it, all of it supports your overall brand and there's some consistency and congruency over everything. So you repeat a message. That's how you get an image to to stand out so much that people know you. All right. Another thing I like to do is I like to offer people a 15 minute mini coaching session. So feel free to take advantage of that. Everybody gets one. So um, there's a link if you want to book some time with me. If you want me to review your logo or talk with me any further about branding issues, I'm happy to help you. And again, I want to thank you for, for showing up today, and I appreciate your time. All right, until next time, happy business building.